Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the EcoStress NASA's Next Generation Mission to Measure Evapotranspiration from the International Space Station webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. While everybody's logging in, you will notice that we have two optional polls at the bottom of the screen, and I'd like to thank all of you in advance for your feedback on these polls. It's 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. What I'd like to do first is go over just a few logistics we related to today's webinar. To ensure, the, to ensure the best audio experience, we have placed participants in silent mode. But if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A pod. And again, you'll find that located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. Today's webinar will be recorded. The recording will be posted both to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. And so once this has been uh, completed, what I'll do is I will send an email to all registrants with both of those recording links. As far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour long with 45 minutes allocated to the presentation and live demonstration and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. So once our speakers have finished with their presentations, what we'll do next is we'll transition to a final set of polling questions. And we usually give these a couple of minutes or so. And then from there, we'll move directly to the Q&A period. Uh, depending upon the volume of questions that are received today, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 PM Eastern time for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. We have two speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker, Dr. Joshua Fisher, is an earth scientist and also the science lead for the EcoStress mission at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He will begin today's webinar with an introduction to the EcoStress mission, measurements, and data products. And then from there, we will transition to our second speaker, Cole Cravel, who is a remote sensing scientist at NASA's Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC. He will conduct a live demonstration that focuses on EcoStress data discovery, data access, and data services. During his demo, he will show you where you can download EcoStress data and provide information about data handling Python scripts and working with EcoStress data within the Jupyter Notebook environment. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Joshua Fisher. Dr. Fisher? And can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Excellent. OK, uh, thank you um, all for uh, coming to this talk. Uh, my name is Josh Fisher. I am a scientist here at JPL uh, and the science lead of EcoStress. The PI of uh, the mission is Simon Hook, and we have a, a great science team uh, representing various uh, facets of how uh, the data can be used. And I was just looking through some of your guys' responses to how you might use the EcoStress data, and they all look really great, um, although I didn't get to read it all. Um, and um, I'll try to address some of those in the talk. So um, the motivation of EcoStress starts with um, kind of the future of the planet, especially with respect to the terrestrial biosphere. And we, uh, we know that um, there are two kind of competing forces uh, that um, are leading to different trajectories in uh, the fate of terrestrial ecosystems, uh, the beta and gamma effect. Um, the beta effect is. Uh, really, uh, CO2 fertilization and sensitivity uh, uh, driving increases in carbon uptake um, by ecosystems. Um, uh, in contrast, there's the gamma effect really related to water and droughts and causing ecosystems to, to suffer and, and die back. So um, it's kind of this, uh, we're interested in the carbon response uh, in, for ecostress as it's tied to the water response. And it's kind of like a dance between carbon and water. And if you actually turn this breathing sign plot on its side, it looks kind of like two dancers, um, which I put here to, to visualize that point. So we've got this carbon response that um, we're interested in as it's tied directly to uh, water and uncertainty in, in the water cycle. And it's not just our uh, natural ecosystems that we're interested in, but our managed ecosystems as well for food security um, and our, our growing populations. And 
it's been challenging to manage water as populations rise, as water becomes more uncertain and variable, and we need to track um, water uh, very precisely. So how exactly is water impacting um, ecosystems? It happens uh, through um, a number of factors, actually, usually through stomata on the leaves. And as water uh, becomes more limiting, plants will shut the, their pores um, to uh, 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 minimize the amount of water loss. But then they, um, they stop taking up CO2 for photosynthesis, uh, which they need for, uh, for metabolism. And so they can risk carbon starvation. Um, and also they can risk overheating because transpiration uh, cools um, the plants. And this is actually what we're picking up with EcoStress directly. So that brings us to evapotranspiration. And it's, it's hard to visualize. This picture here is not evapotranspiration. It's just fog, but you can pretend it's water coming off that you can see. And as it comes out of leaves, again, hard to see the stomata. So I put this little uh, picture of a geyser on here so you can pretend there's like water shooting out of this leaf. Um, and so it is uh, a unique variable uh, because it connects the water cycle and the, car and the energy cycle and the carbon cycle. It's a water variable in that you're um, converting liquid water to water vapor from the land to the atmosphere. Um, it's an energy cycle variable because it requires energy to evaporate water as the latent heat flux. And, um, and it's connected to the carbon cycle through the opening and closing of stomata, uh, releasing water uh, for transpiration, taking up carbon for photosynthesis, or stopping that process when there's water limitations uh, or other limitations as well. Um, it's also a unique variable in that it's controlled by a number of facets. It's controlled by vegetation. Uh, certain plants will close their stomata at certain times or water limitations that other plants won't do. Um, the same plant will do it differently depending on successional stage or, or life stage, rooting depth, soil characteristics, and so on. Um, it's controlled by the amount of energy uh, coming in from the sun, and it's also controlled by atmospheric conditions. Uh, dry conditions might um, uh, uh, facilitate more evapor evaporation than a humid environment. At the same time, very dry conditions might cause to model closure. So there's an atmospheric component as well. And evapotranspiration is a unique variable throughout the Earth sciences. It connects to a lot of different uh, disciplines and applications and sciences within the Earth sciences. It's the, uh, the leading climatic predictor of biodiversity where you have a lot of water and energy, you have a lot of evapotranspiration, and you also have a lot of life. And where you don't have a lot of water and energy, um, uh, you don't have a lot of ET or uh, biodiversity. It's the uh, leading uh, indicator as well for um, irrigation. Farmers want to water as much as their plants will use, uh, not more. Um, uh, and usually not less unless you're trying to uh, have a stress or a deficit irrigation. And water managers as well want to know how much water to allocate to different um, uh, sectors based on water demand and use. It's, um, it's a leading indicator of flash droughts, those rapid onset droughts that we're seeing more prevalent um, nowadays. <coughs> the weather um, community is interested in ET um, because of cloud formation, especially inland, uh, in continents, far from the oceans. Uh, clouds are formed from the recycling of precipitation uh, back through evapotranspiration and back to cloud formation. And large-scale ecosystems are sustained uh, by this recycling of ET, for example, in the Amazon basin uh, and, and, uh, and elsewhere. And then at climatic scales, we're interested in the overall uh, wetting and drying of the, of the land. And that's related to um, patterns and trends and sensitivities in evapotranspiration. So ultimately, we want to know uh, how do different plants respond to changes in water availability. In a kind of more uh, dire way of asking this question is if there are droughts or changes in water uh, cycling, which plants die first? And so you can imagine this landscape, which I've uh, which I'm showing you in black and white, and there's a drought that hits. And certain trees and certain species will uh, respond and die first, and we want to know that. 
And so this is related to the water use efficiency, or basically how efficient different plants are with their water. Um, and it's defined as the amount of carbon in divided by water out, the amount of carbon fixed for photosynthesis um, per amount of water used to fix that carbon. And uh, plants with, that are more efficient with their water can uh, potentially be more resilient in the face of increasing droughts. So these are all wrapped up into eco, the, the three science questions for ecostress. And the first one is, how is the terrestrial biosphere responding to changes in water availability? Um, the second one is a little bit more of a kind of uh, geeky biology question. Um, and that is uh, related to how do changes in diurnal vegetation water stress impact the global carbon cycle? So um, it's something that we've not really seen from uh, a remote sensing perspective, especially with our polar orbiters. But there are changes over the course of the day uh, from a plant physiological perspective. And we want to know that. Um, and three is more to our managed ecosystems. And can agricultural vulnerability uh, be reduced through advanced monitoring of agricultural consumptive use and improved drought detection? So what do we need to do to be able to answer those science questions? Well, we need accurate, uh, high spatial resolution, high temporal resolution, diurnal cycle, global scale ET. Uh, not a lot to ask from uh, Santa NASA. Um, it is kind of a lot to ask from Santa NASA. That's why we haven't seen it before. But now we have it. Um, so uh, to illustrate some of these requirements more, here's a landscape. And as we paint on the vegetation, you can start to see the riparian corridors. And if you look at the ET signature from a one kilometer pixel, and this is from MODIS, you don't see it. But if you do from a uh, 60 meter or a sub 100 meter pixel from Landsat, uh, you can start to see the spatial resolution requirements uh, that are ne uh, needed to be able to pick up these patterns. Our managed ecosystems are even more heterogeneous um, spatially, and a one kilometer pixel will mix a lot of that heterogeneity, um, whereas a sub 100 meter pixel will be able to capture that a lot better. So we can see that Landsat actually has uh, really great spatial resolution. Um, and basically, the re spatial resolution needed to be able to pick up the spatial characteristics of evapotranspiration. What about the temporal resolution, the temporal dynamics? Here is evapotranspiration measured uh, on the ground at an eddy flux site every, you know, every 30 minutes or so, averaged out. Now, Landsat passes over us only every 16 days. And if there's a cloud in the way, then it'd be every 32 days. And so while it has great spatial resolution, uh, the temporal dynamics of ET are not well captured by Landsat. Now, how about that diurnal cycle? This is, a, this is ET over the course of the day. And you can see that in the afternoon there, there's a bit of water stress and the stomata um, pictured in the background there um, close and shut down ET and then open back up um, into the early evening as things become less um, uh, demanding and stressful, and to do a little bit more photosynthesis. So neither MODIS or Landsat can get the diurnal cycle. They're polar orbiters. They pass over us at the same time each time, usually around like 10:30 in the morning, morning for uh, Landsat and Terra. Um, now geostationary satellites uh, will get that diurnal cycle. They pa they're over our heads all the time. They don't necessarily uh, they're in global, um, but you do sacrifice a bit of a spatial resolution with that. So here's goes over um, the US. And if we zoom into that pivot irrigation from Landsat, the spatial resolution of goes, while it's great at the diurnal cycle, um, the, this course resolution um, will mix any differences within those pixels. So that brings us to the International Space Station. We haven't seen the ISS used uh, a lot for Earth science investigation. We see you know, the astronauts on board doing interesting uh, you know, microgravity experiments and so on. But uh, it's an interesting platform because um, it actually passes over us at different times every time and uh, has an orbit that allows us to get great spatial resolution. And so we thought, you know, this is great for uh, the eco-stress science questions because we'll get the diurnal sampling, we'll get, the, um, we'll get our good spatial resolution, and it passes over us every about three to five days. So we're able to get 
um, a pretty good temporal uh, sampling um, uh, seasonally. So EcoStress <coughs> occupies this nice niche of, of, you know, the best of the temporal world from MODIS and, and the spatial world of Landsat um, and get some diurnal sampling uh, similar to GOES. GOES is better with that, so, um, uh, or geostationary satellites in general. And so it's enab it now enables us to answer new science questions that we weren't able to do uh, from this unique uh, space. Um, so it's a thermal radiometer, and it's also the most accurate um, surface temperature thermal radiometer uh, measurement from space available. There's uh, multiple bands. We've got uh, multiple calibration on board. Um, so it, it does a really good job. And so uh, we have a number of uh, pro data product levels, and Cole uh, will describe more of those in detail. But we basically um, go from radiance, our level run product, and then we go up four levels, and each level kind of adds a little bit more ancillary data and adds a new uh, dimensionality of use for um, the, the EcoStress data. Our level two product is uh, the temperature emissivity separation algorithm, and that's led by Glenn Hulley at JPL. And this uh, test algorithm is used uh, by Aster, by Landsat, by MODIS, and it has a very good heritage and good accuracy for temperature and emissivity. Uh, then we ingest that up into our level three product um, and uh, to create evapotranspiration with more ancillary data for uh, meteorology. Um, and we use the PTJPL algorithm for our global scale product. We also um, run a dyslexy Alexi um, algorithm for uh, select sites for uh, research applications by our partner, uh, Martha Anderson at USDA. And then our level four products, uh, we have two products. Um, oh, and I should mention, because I think I read somewhere, uh, someone typed this into their interest. Uh, th this also partitions ET into the three components of ET, canopy transpiration, soil evaporation, and interception evaporation, which is, uh, has a lot of interesting science to it, especially with uh, changing climate and so on. Uh, our level four products, um, we have water use efficiency. So we take a carbon in product. Right now we're taking uh, the, the MODIS GPP product, um, although um, we're exploring other uh, possibilities for that. Um, and then we divide that by the EcoStress ET. And then we also have a drought index called the Evaporative Stress Index, um, where we take the ET divided by the potential ET. Uh, and this is based on work by Martha Anderson and Chris Hain and others. Uh, so uh, this is what our ET looks like from MODIS. Uh, we've been running uh, the, these algorithms um, for many, many years. Um, and this is what the evaporative stress index looks like from Martha Anderson. It was, the, it was one of the only, if not the only, drought index to capture the 2012 uh, U.S. Midwest drought in terms of in intensity and magnitude, um, which is really important because it actually is uh, dealing with how plants respond to drought, so more of an agricultural or ecological drought as opposed to a meteorological or other, or other definitions of drought. And then these algorithms have been tested uh, throughout the literature at lots of eddy flux sites um, and tends to do a pretty good job. And uh, lots of people have uh, been looking at these, at the algorithm as well as the data. So, um, so we've got a great science uh, system and requirements. Let me just take you a little bit behind the curtain at JPL where we built the instrument, uh, just to give you a sense of what it looks like. Um, and uh, it, you know, it looks like a kind of a really big fridge, a big gold fridge. Um, and you'll see that um, the instruments on the outside of the space station all look kind of like that. They all look like these giant boxes, and they plug in very similarly, even if the insides are, are different. And you know, I kind of liken that to um, like a a thumb drive USB port, you know, they all kind of plug in the same way. So this is like a USB thumb drive, like, to the next level. Um, and so, you know, we build it at JPL, and, you know, we, we put it on this giant shaker to simulate the rocket launch and, you know, see what breaks and fix it. And um, and then, you know, we blast it with radiation. And, you know, we do all this engineering testing. So we, were, we wrote the proposal in 2013. We were selected in 2014. And we launched in 2018. So we spent four years, the last kind of four years, basically building and doing a lot of the engineering work. Um, so this next slide is going to be a little bit of a little video.
that um, JPL put together to kind of describe the, the mission. Um, and I will see if it works. Let's see. Go. Um, our ability to sustain food production, we're interested in our ecosystem health, and that's all tied to water. How much water our plants, our crops need, we want to know. And as water resources become more uncertain, more variable, we need to really track that really precisely. We can't just guess anymore. So EcoStress is going to measure the surface temperature, and then we're going to use that surface temperature to be able to determine how much water the plants that we're looking at are using. We'd like to show how we can use EcoStress data to optimize agricultural water use. EcoStress is an instrument that's going to go on the International Space Station. It stands for the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station. It focuses on how much water plants use all over the planet and how much water plants need and if there's stress, water stress or heat stress that plants are facing. We can measure the surface of the temperature of the Earth within a few tenths of a degree and then we can use that information to look at objects on the surface of the Earth. In this particular case we're interested in looking at plants. Plants, as they start to suffer from heat or water stress, they begin to heat up in a similar way to a human with a fever. We can pick up that stress before the plant is visibly affected. So there's this window where water resource management and agricultural users can actually allocate more water before they die, before the damage is irreparable. The space station is going to fly over at different times to be able to look at how the stress is changing through the day and allow us to characterize vegetation in ways that we've never been able to uh, characterize it before. The instrument itself is looking down at the surface of the Earth and it uses a mirror that rotates to scan across the surface. And this measurement is being made in microseconds, but it's enough time for us to measure the energy that's coming off it and then translate that energy into a temperature. The temperature measurements from EcoStress can detect volcanoes. We can detect urban heat in cities. So although we're focused primarily on looking at plants and making sure that we can maximize the amount of food that we can get back for the water that we use, the mission can be used for many other purposes. What hasn't been possible in the past is to make the measurements as frequently as we need to make them with sufficient detail and it's that combination that is so important and really that's just a reflection of the improvements in technology. Our ability to sustain livelihoods, food production, ecosystems and the health of the planet through EcoStress data is invaluable. <coughs> okay, so, um, so we launched uh, and, and can you guys hear me? Just to sound check again. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so we launched in the summer, uh, in June, uh, at 5:30 in the morning, um, out of Kennedy Space Center, um, Cape Canaveral, Florida, um, and we went up on a, a SpaceX rocket, um, so commercial rocket, uh, Elon Musk, SpaceX, uh, and they, they were already contracted to do a cargo resupply for the astronauts, food, and other experiments, and so on. So. Um, we actually didn't even need to pay for the ride out of uh, the mission, which helped keep costs down a bit. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, it, was a, it was a beautiful launch. It, it was raining on either side of the, the launch window, um, and it just cleared uh, in the, um, for our launch morning, and it was, it was just a beautiful launch. The sun started to rise right when we were, you know, we couldn't see the rocket anymore in the sky, and we could see it pretty much get to orbit. Uh, and, and right when the, right when you couldn't really see it anymore, uh, we turned to the big screen uh, um, next to us to see the onboard camera, and you could see the final separation of the Dragon payload from the Falcon 9 rocket. And you could see inside the Dragon 9, uh, or the, the Falcon, um, sorry, the Dragon, you could see EcoStress right when Earth, uh, right when Earth started to come into to view. And here's actually a, a clip of uh, that. Uh, so you can kind of see. You might recognize EcoStress from the pictures I showed earlier. So we launch on June 29th, but uh, at, at this point we have to catch up to the International Space Station, which is going thousands of miles per hour around the Earth. 
And it takes us basically three days to catch up to the space station uh, in, you know, another kind of dance between the Dragon and the space station. Um, and uh, it takes nine hours uh, after we dock for the Canadian robotic arm to reach inside the Dragon, grab EcoStress, uh, pull it out, pass it over to the Japanese robotic arm, and we actually got installed on the Japanese uh, part of the space station, the uh, uh, experimental module exposed facility. So uh, this next uh, clip is going to be a video of, uh, of that, that three day and the nine hour process sped up to like 60 seconds, uh, showing what the astronauts could see as the Dragon started approaching um, uh, the, the space station. And um, hopefully we'll get this audio to work better this time. All right, cool. So um, let me get back to my screen. Um, so yeah, that that's just kind of a you know a neat little video just to see you know kind of the behind the scenes engineering of it. Um, so um, uh, so we had a cool you know the instrument down, it's a thermal radiometer, and our first light we happened to be flying over the Nile River um, in, in Egypt um, at night, and you could pick up the cold river against the hot desert and the, the, the cool irrigation aspects. And it was just kind of really a neat image for our first light, um, you know, and kind of symbolic of one of the birthplaces of humankind and the birthplace of eco-stress. Um, in July, um, we, you know, in, in California, where, where we are, there were a number of fires. And we're like, oh, we can actually see those from eco-stress as well. So um, we, you know, put out a, a little press release on those fires that we were picking up from EcoStress. Um, and we zoomed into our home, a city of Los Angeles, uh, from the temperature, again at night. And you could see the urban heat, the, the freeways, the, the parking lots, the refineries, and so on, uh, storing that heat from the daytime well into the night. Um, and this is what the evapotranspiration uh, looks like. Here we are flying over Texas. Um, and you can see on the right, the swath width, it's pretty. It's a pretty big swath width. That's about a 400 kilometer swath width, which is why we're able to get such great repeat coverage. Um, Atlanta is about like 100 and so uh, kilometers, so we're able to get a lot more, which allows us to get better temporal repeat. And then you zoom into an, uh, one of those, you know, a little spot, and you can pick up the detail of these pivot irrigation farms. Not only the differences between farms, but also the differences within farms, where farmers are managing their crops or their water differently within these pivot uh, uh, irrigation fields. So that's pretty cool. Um, here's another image in Kansas in Garden City, which is just kind of striking to, to show you um, the heterogeneity that we're not now picking up both in space as well as uh, the accuracy allow, uh, necessary to pick up these differences, and then the temporal repeat to show changes in time. Uh, here's an example of that diurnal cycle uh, sampling uh, in New Mexico in Navajo Nation. Uh, territory where the bottom image is um, around noon and the, the the fields are all happily evapotranspiring and then the image above is taken in the afternoon a couple hours uh, later and you can see a lot of those fields are still nice and happy and 
about for transpiring, but some of those fields are actually starting to dry down. And that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. That's something that we've never really been able to see before uh, with, with, from space um, because of the spatial uh, resolution, the diurnal sampling, and so on, and the accuracy. So that's pretty, a, a really nice example uh, of uh, the diurnal uh, sampling. Um, here we are flying over um, the southern Amazon, um, and you can see that swath list in the bottom left. And you can see a lot of the deforestation or conversion to agriculture against the more pristine forest, these, this, these, this nice uh, shade of velvet ET throughout the forest. Uh, and one of the, the postdocs here at JPL, I showed him this image, and he said, oh, you know, I actually worked on the ground uh, right in this little Im uh, spot here um, a number of years ago. And there was this old fire experiment where they burned and didn't burn. And it's long been since abandoned and has regrown, and you couldn't tell, uh, tell it from the ground. But uh, EcoStress was actually able to pick up this old kind of historic experiment, you know, kind of like space archaeology, which was pretty neat. So uh, uh, since we've been collecting data, a lot of the science activity has been focused on uh, validation and calibration, uh, or, or really just validation of the different data. There's no calibration as of yet. Um, because the data are looking really good, and we've been collecting um, a lot, a lot of uh, data from uh, over a hundred uh, Ediflux sites from around the world. Um, the our partners from around the world have been very um, supportive and enthusiastic, and contributing data very rapidly. Um, and so we've been having to process those data and deal with quality flags and so on. Uh, but this is what uh, kind of a first light of the EcoStress data looks like against these uh, different uh, sites. And it's just, it, it really floored me when I saw the, um, how good EcoStress ET was doing, it was performing against the ground data across all these sites uncalibrated. Um, and now, we, we do produce uh, different levels of quality. Uh, uh, we have different quality flags in there, and this is the highest quality. And then there's lower quality uh, data, which are pretty good, not as, not as good, but um, we thought, let's produce high quality and low quality, because the low quality data is probably still useful for some people. But you should pay attention to that as you uh, start to work with the data. And so now just the next steps are kind of uh, how do we use the data beyond uh, the science and get it into the applications community, get it into uh, your hands uh, you know, on the line for all your different use cases. Um, how do we work with the DAC to come up with um, innovative tools to deal with the massive amount of data, the 70 meters data um, that can be used by lots of different people and, you know, exploring design options and, and distribution options. Uh, we had the, the head of NASA, Jim Bridenstine, the administrator, come by JPL uh, to check out EcoStress. Um, um, and um, Administrator Bridenstine was appointed by President Trump and regularly meets with Vice President uh, Pence on the Space Council. And he came in, and we showed him a little demo where we watered the plant on the left and not on the right. Um, and we had a little handheld thermal camera. And you could see that the plant on the left was cooler than the right. And he kind of just you know, stared at me for a little while. And then he just started nodding. And he, he, he got really into it. And he took this like selfie and tweeted it on Twitter. And um, he's been going on media just talking about uh, evapotranspiration and eco-stress. And, Damata, and you know he's, he's kind of geeking out like the rest of us, which is which is really awesome to have the head of NASA really into this kind of science um, and, and mission. So we're really excited about that. Um, and 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 Jim Bryanstein is also very, very much interested in helping uh, food security in the agricultural community as well. So <laughs> that's a little bit of what we've been up to for EcoStress uh, over the past few years, building the mission as well as the past few months as the data start to roll in. And um, we're releasing the data. There's an early adopters program if you want to deal with the, the different versions as, we, as we're uh, sorting those out. Um, and then uh, we're just going to hopefully uh, get the maximum amount of science and, and utility out of these data um, as, as they continue to roll in. So that's my presentation. And uh, I hope uh, that you found it interesting. And we'll be looking forward to questions. And I will pass it back to uh, Jennifer, who will introduce Cole from LPDAC, um, and he'll tell you a little bit more about the nitty-gritty of how you access data and get into the data. Thanks. Okay. Here's going to be Cole Cravel. He is a 
remote sensing scientist at NASA's LP. All right, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Josh, for that interesting presentation on ego stress. My name is Cole Crable, and I'm a remote sensing scientist working as a contractor to NASA's Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC. The LPDAC will archive all of the EcoStress Level 1B and higher level products seen here. EcoStress Level 1B products became publicly available on March 27, 2019, also known as yesterday. These include the geolocation parameters and radiance products. The higher level products will be released this summer with an anticipated release date in June. You can see there are a number of higher level products such as the land surface temperature and emissivity, evapotranspiration, water use efficiency, evaporative stress index, and associated cloud and QA masks. The LPDAC will also archive the dyslexia evapotranspiration and evaporative stress index data produced by the USDA at 30 meter resolution. So I noticed there was a question about that, so hopefully that clears that up for you guys. So next, I wanted to conclude our webinar today by providing you all with some information and resources for accessing EcoStress data. First, I want to show you all where you can download the newly released EcoStress data, starting with NASA's Earth Data Search Client. Earth Data Search Client is a web application that helps you search and access Earth observation data made available by NASA and partner institutions. The application allows users to search for data using a variety of tools, such as spatial and temporal parameters. You can find Earth Data Search Client at search.earthdata.nasa.gov. Um, also, I wanted to mention that all of the links that I will reference today are located in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. To download data in Earth Data Search Client, you will need to log in to your NASA Earth Data login account. And so you can log in by clicking the button here in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. If you are not already logged in or if you do not have an account, you will be taken to the Earth Data login page, which you can see just popped up there, where you can either sign in or register for an account. So now that I'm signed in, I'm going to go ahead and search for EcoStress in the search bar. Go ahead and hit Enter. So note, as an admin user, I have access to a few more products than are currently publicly available. But you guys should see four matching collections. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down until I find the resampled radiance product. Click into that product, since this is the product I'm interested in, and we can see there are over 11,000 matching granules. So we can continue to subset the data by selecting a time period of interest. So I'm going to do that by clicking on this temporal clock here, and then click into start date, and that will bring up a calendar, and I can go ahead and navigate, let's say, to search for all March observations. So I'll select March 1st. And then a nifty little trick is if you are interested with all observations until the present, you can go ahead and click Today. And then we can go ahead and click Apply Filter. So now we're just looking at resampled radiance for the month of March. And we can see we're down to a little under 1,000 granules. So we can continue to subset um, to receive the data that we'd like uh, spatially. So if I go ahead and pan over, and I'm going to zoom in here, so let's say I'm interested in the Snake River Valley in Idaho. I can click on this spatial subsetter here, and I'm going to draw a bounding box over the Snake River Valley. So here we can see now we have 26 matching granules. So once you have your desired granules, your subset of data that you're interested in, you can go ahead and select Download All. This will take you to the data access page where you can submit a request for data. If you are interested in downloading the data directly, you can also check out the LPDAC data pool, which you can see here. And I provided a link to that in the link section as well. Next, I wanted to show you all where you could find a couple of resources for working with EcoStress data after you have successfully downloaded it. This page here is the LPDAC data user resources repository. And again, all the links are available in the box in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Here you can find our R and Python resources for working with LPDAC data. Now I will go into the EcoStress Swath to Grid directory. The EcoStress Swath to Grid conversion 
resampling script is a Python script that allows users to resample the natively swathed EcoStress products using the latitude and longitude arrays provided in the Eco1B Geo product. Also, the script can be used to convert the Eco1B MapRad product into a Northup geographic latlon or UCM projection. The script is a command line executable that converts EcoStress data products stored as swaths in HDF5 file format into projected geotiffs. When executing the script, a user will submit a desired input directory containing EcoStress swath data products and an output projection as command line arguments. The swaths are resampled to a grid using nearest neighbor resampling from the PI resample package using the KD tree algorithm. Output projection options include UTM and geographic. Ultimately, the script exports each gridded array as a geotiff using GDAL. By default, the script will loop through and perform the resampling for each science data set in the HDF5 file. There is an optional argument that allows you to select a subset of science data sets within a given product. Also, the script will batch process all EcoStress swap files contained in the input directory provided. So if we scroll down here, the readme shows the list of available products that the script can be used to execute on, as well as directions for setting up a compatible Python environment. So to execute the script, you will need to download your desired EcoStress files and corresponding Eco1B Geo files into a directory, download the EcoStress swap.py script, set up a compatible Python environment, and execute the script on the command line. Now, if you are more interested in a step-by-step -step approach to working with EcoStress data in Python, we have also recently published a Jupyter Notebook tutorial that includes parts of the EcoStress swath to grid functionality wrapped around a real-world use case provided by Gregory Halverson at JPL. So if I scroll back up and go back to the LPDIR repository, and next move into the tutorial-ecostress directory, Here's where you can download the Working with EcoStress Data in Python Jupyter Notebook tutorial. Again, reference the README for information on how to get started with setting up a compatible Python environment and executing the notebook yourself. In the interest of time, rather than doing a live demo of the tutorial, I will show you the HTML output and give a brief overview of the topics covered. So this tutorial uses the EcoStress Evapotranspiration PTJPL Level 3 Global 70 Meter Version 1 product. The use case example shows how to convert an Eco3 ETPTJPL HDF5 swath file into a gridded array to compare EcoStress evapotranspiration with ground-based ET observation from an Ameriflux flux tower location in California. Here you can see the topics covered in the tutorial, including some basic Python setup and how to import and work with the HDF5 data. From there, the tutorial demonstrates how to perform the swath to grid resampling using the lat lawn arrays from the corresponding Eco1B Geo file. The output is a spatially referenced array that can, we can then use to compare with ground-based flux tower observations. The tutorial also includes information on visualizing the data and ultimately how to visually compare the EcoStress ET versus the ground-based ET observation. So getting started, here we begin by importing the necessary packages and setting up our working environment. The input directory here is defined as the current working directory on your local machine, so make sure that the level three and corresponding Eco1B Geo files, as well as the FluxTower CSV data, are all located in that directory. Moving on to step two, here we use the h5py package to read in the hdf5 file and open the desired science data set. So once I have the instantaneous ET and uncertainty data set, the following section shows the step-by-step -step process used to perform the swath to grid resampling conversion. The tutorial uses the py resample package to perform the KD tree resampling algorithm with the nearest neighbor approach. Once we have our resampled gridded array, the tutorial goes through some basic image processing techniques, such as applying the scale factor and add offset and setting the fill value. After that, the gridded EcoStress arrays are exported to GeoTIF using GDAL. Next, the tutorial shows how to import a CSV file containing ET observations 
from the US CZ3 flux tower located in the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California. The tutorial then shows how to match the tower location with a specific pixel location in the EcoStress graded array. This next section here is my personal favorite where we get to visualize the data. So if we scroll down, here's a basic plot of the entire EcoStress observation with the flux tower location marked with an X in black here. However, we can zoom in a little closer to see some more detail. So here we see the flux tower location in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, as well as some agriculture down in California's Central Valley here. And again, note that higher ET is shown in shades of blue and green. The tutorial then moves on to show how to visualize the flux tower ET data and ultimately plot the eco-stress retrieved ET in comparison with the ground-based observations using the uncertainty layer to show the amount of uncertainty in the observation. So just last week, the EcoStress science team at JPL and the LPDAC hosted a joint workshop that went through these materials and more. I know I went through these very quickly today, but so if you guys are interested, you can go through the materials on your own time. Uh, if you weren't able to attend the workshop, but you'd like to look over those materials. And so one thing you will notice here is that this is on the e-learning section of our new website. So we ha um, have a newly revamped website, which you can go ahead and check out, check out all of our e-learning materials. And then, of course, if you do want to look at the workshop materials, if you click on materials, that will take you back to the data user resources repository where you can find all of the necessary materials in order to go through those. The final piece of information that I did want to mention today is that we are also working on development for EcoStress to be added to the application for extracting and exploring analysis-ready samples, or APPEARS, which will include a similar work workflow as the swath to grid functionality. Now, I don't have a concrete date for when that will be released. However, if you want to be the first to know, I encourage you all to sign up for the LPDAC listserv at the link provided in the links box below. Thank you all for your time, and now I'm going to pass it back over to Jennifer. Okay, great. Thank you, Cole. At this point, what we'll do is we'll transition to a final set of polling questions, and we'll give these questions about three to four minutes or so, and then from there we'll move directly to the question and answer period. All right, so thanks, everybody. We'll give these about three minutes or so, and then we'll move to the Q&A.
All right, everybody, we're going to give this another minute or so, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Okay, thank you everybody. At this point, we will transition to the Q&A session. What are the potential urban heat island effect applications? Um, yeah, so, okay, yeah. Um, so I, I quickly showed one slide where uh, we were picking up the urban heat island effect in Los Angeles. Uh, I think there's great, great, great potential for urban heat island uh, studies uh, using um, the L2 data. And Glenn Hulley at JPL has been doing a lot of um, work on that. So, yeah, lots of great potentials for that. Okay, thank you, Josh. Our next question is, is the thermal data also available to download or only latent heat evapotranspiration product will be available? Uh, both. The question is uh, whether or not the uh, files would be available and either a JSON or GeoJSON file output. Uh, and this particular user is looking to develop an app. I'll, I'll let Cole answer that one. Um, can we elaborate on which files the user is talking about in terms of being available as JSON or GeoJSON? So if they're yeah. referencing if they're referencing the actual EcoStress data, that's all raster data, so we wouldn't be able to provide that as JSON or GeoJSON files. Um, now, in terms of like the footprints of, of EcoStress data, um, that is something that could be available as GeoJSON. But um, like you'll notice when you do search in NASA's Earth Data Search Client, you will see the footprints come up, um, so you can visually at least look at that. And I think actually JPL2 has a um, web service where, like a map where you can see the footprints of eco-stress observations. Um, but is there any clarification on what data there or which files we're talking about? I do not see further clarification at this point. So let's go ahead and move on to the next question, which is uh, regarding coverage, whether or not there's global coverage. Yeah, so uh, the space station sees all, only as far north and south as about 52 latitude, uh, 52 north and south. Um, so we don't see polar areas, but it's pretty far north. Like we get, you know, a little bit of Canada and we get England and lots of Northern Europe and so on. Um, and then uh, it, it's basically always on, but we throw out the, the data over the ocean because that's just way too much. Um, and then we have these uh, prioritized uh, hotspot areas, which are mapped out on, on the EcoStress website. Uh, for that are to deal with our science questions and those are the data that are available uh, right now um, uh, for the level two uh, level one through four products uh, you'll also if you uh, look on the EcoStress website there's a like a, a mapping function to see where we passed over any given day um, you'll see lots of coverage um, uh, beyond those hotspot areas and those data are available I think only through level one um, to the public uh, as of now, um, and uh, we're working uh, at details with headquarters about uh, making the level two through four uh, data available for those outside areas as well. Okay, thank you. The next question is, from the presentation, EcoStress ET is modeled using the ETPT JPL model. Can one get the surface variables from the sensor, for example, LST, emiss emissivity, NDVI, LA, LAI independently to model evapotranspiration using different ET models. Yeah, so the LST and E are available as the level two product. 
The other ancillary data that go into the level two through uh, four products, we don't make available because they're not our data, um, but um, you can get a lot of those data directly from the DAC and um, working with Cole and others at the DAC, they have these really great tools that will like show you other data coincident with our data um, and they're, they're still kind of rolling those out, but um, yeah. Yeah, so the input data that are um, archived at the LP DAC are also available in Appears, which is what I mentioned at the end of the presentation, uh, the application for extracting and exploring analysis-ready samples. And so one of the big um, driving motivating factors for us to get EcoStress into Appears is so that you could order, say, MODIS GPP, which is an input to the, the level four products, and you could request that alongside the, uh, the EcoStress data um, so that you get both of those as outputs. Um, so yeah, and, and definitely email us to offline um, if you're interested in specific products. We can talk more about that. Okay, great. Thank you, Cole. Our next question is, uh, I would like to make seasonal maps with these products on Atlas Mountains. Where do I uh, show analytics? Is there any support for such projects? Or where I do snow analytics, excuse me, is there any support for such projects? Is that a Cole question or a me question? I'm not sure. Can you repeat that one, Jennifer? Sure. So this particular user wants to make seasonal maps with these products on the Atlas Mountains where this uh, participant is doing snow analytics. Is there yeah. any support for such projects? Yeah, I guess, again, my answer, uh, I think that's a very interesting use case, first of all. Second of all, um, in appears, I know I keep bringing up appears, but um, we do actually have MODIS snow cover products, which are coming from the National Snow and Ice Data Center DAC, or NSIDC. And so, again, that would allow you to at least get back analysis-ready samples of both snow cover or things like NDSI uh, alongside your eco-stress data so that you could then um, begin to look at snow analytics um, in the Atlas Mountains. Okay, great. Thank you, Cole. And so uh, to access the APPEARS tool, you would go to the lpdac.usgs.gov website and then click on Tools, and you'll find a link to that specific um, point-based uh, or area-based extraction tool. Um, and then, let's see here, the next question is, what is the easiest way to find out future overpass times and return times or specific locations in order to coordinate with ground-based measurements? Um, so I think there's a tool on our EcoStress website. There's a lot of tools, and it's always evolving. And I think we're going to revamp it because it's getting cluttered, and, and we're trying to make it look prettier. But there's a tool that tells you, um, I, well, so I, I don't think you even need to go to the EcoStress website. There's like lots of tools that tell you when the space station is going to pass over your head, because people like to look for it in the sky. Um, now, you, you only know about two weeks out, like kind of like weather prediction, because, um, you know, there's operations going on at the space station that, you know, make it unpredict unpredictable for more than, like, say, two weeks out. But um, so, you know, for those of you who are planning campaigns for coincident, you know, uh, measurements uh, with the overpass, um, you, <laughs> we can't help you more than uh, two weeks out, basically. Um, so. Okay, thank you, Josh. The next question is, um, just give me one second here. So one of the questions earlier on, and I know you typed an answer into the pod, there was a user that had asked whether or not um, a second year of EcoStress had been approved. Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as I understand, we are, um, we're, we're good to stay on past, our, past the first year. Okay, <clears throat> and moving on to the next question. What is, okay, excuse me. Okay, I would like to know if data will be available in Google Earth Engine in the near future. Yeah, I can take that one. So that you will have to ask Google. Um, we do not have any plans with them um, in terms of which data sets they decide to ingest from the archive, but um, they are definitely um, able to, to ingest EcoStress data and put it in Google Earth Engine if they so please. Um, so I would just recommend that you ask them about that. 
and, I, and I'd love to see it on Google Earth Engine. Uh, you know, a lot of people use that, and I'm all about people using the data more and whatever works best for them. Um, yeah, we've been talking to Google a little bit, and yeah, you know, I'm, I'm definitely supportive of that. Okay, thanks to both of you. The next question is, what's the precision of the EcoStress Level 2 land surface temperature data? Can I use LST over the coastal water and inland water? Oh, yeah, great question, both of you. Yeah, and I saw that up there. I, I apologize for not addressing it. The querying quality assessment for the level one through two uh, radiance and surface temperature product is really good. It's under uh, it's under one Kelvin uh, accuracy uh, in the temperature, so it looks really good. Um, and then in terms of the use for coastal waters um, or inland waters, um, also really good. We've got um, some early adopters already working on that. Christine Lee, who is our applications lead at EcoStress, her science specialty is on water quality, and she's already taking a look at the data um, for um, water quality, and um, so far things are looking really good, so yeah. Okay, wonderful, thank you. All right, are there any, let's see here, it looks like there may be another. The next question is, would the cloud mask of the data would be delivered, would the cloud mask or the data be delivered together? So I can take that. Going back to that first slide that I had, you'll notice that the cloud mask is actually a separate product. Um, so you would likely want to order both, say you're interested in the surface temperature data. You'd want to order the level two LSTE as well as the cloud mask. Um, now some of the data sets themselves do have quality control or QC, QA layers. Um, so you can look into those as well, but, but the cloud mask will be a separate product, yes. Okay, great. Someone, Thanks. I think, I think Jennifer, someone asked earlier the native pro, uh, resolution, I think maybe someone said, or projection. I can't remember what it was. I don't know if you caught that. But I didn't quite, I, I might not have made that clear that the actual native resolution is this kind of really like funky rectangle. It's like 38 by 69 meters of, of uh, our pixel size. And we just make square, you know, relatively square 70 by 70 meter uh, pixels because it's just easier for people to deal with. So that's our native um, resolution. And then the data uh, are in base station swath format, which um, you know people aren't entirely be happy about, but you got to deal with it. Yeah, so if you do want to put that data into a you know, projected coordinate reference system, you will want to probably use the, some of the tools that, that I've shown here today or wait till the data are available and appears. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And just could you repeat again the uh, how the northern and southern latitude as far as coverage? I believe you said 50 do, 52 degrees north and 52 degrees south. Yep, that's right. All right. Oh yeah, I All should right. also address. Um, and I think there was a question on instrument health and like there was these kind of like radiation blackout uh, areas for like southern South America. So um, we had. Uh, two data storage, mass storage units on EcoStress, and they ended up getting fried by the radiation, so we uh, stopped, we st tried to stop covering over like southern South America, um, but we're, we just kind of gave up on that, and we're going to end up just direct stream the data to the space station and have it beam down um, to Earth directly instead of storing it on the instrument. So those blackout areas over the, the uh, over southern South America are going away, like in I don't know a couple of weeks or something, when we finalize the um, the engineering on that one. So um, if you see on the website this kind of blackout area over southern South America, uh, that's going away in a couple of weeks, and that also is related to the instrument health in terms of these data storage units that were getting fried by the radiation. To answer that, so the answer is yes, they are available uh, for early adopters already. Uh, the higher level products. Um, so sign up to be an early adopter, although that should be going away soon too, right, Cole? Isn't it just like going to be everything? Yeah, so by June when we release all of the higher level products, then it won't be necessary. But yeah, for now, if you do want access to those higher level products, become an early adopter. Yeah, so they're available. Um, and then I guess people asked about the presentation availability. Um, so mine, 
I can try to get as a PDF. Obviously, there's these like enormous videos, and people don't want to download, um, you know, gigabyte upon gigabyte files. So I'll try to make some sort of streamlined PDF that people can take, you know, for the take-home points uh, out. And and I think Coles as well. Okay. Yeah, we can, just... add, we can add my slide into Josh's presentation too, and then all sure. of the materials that I showed are publicly available. So go ahead and check those out. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and definitely feel free to send an email to me or Cole or anyone on the mission. Um, we're definitely interested in collaborations and encouraging science and applications and helping where we can help out. There's a, a, a NASA ROSES solicitation right now for EcoStress, um, and there'll be a lot more. EcoStress is mentioned in other of the ROSES solicitations currently um, out, but there'll be a lot more. Um, a lot more use of the data in different solicitations, and the more we can encourage that, the, the better. So um, we're definitely happy to help out where we can, and feel free to shoot us any emails, and if we can help in any other way, um, please let us know. Absolutely. All right. Well, at this point, if there are no further questions, what we'll do is we will log off from the audio component and leave the virtual meeting space open an additional 10 minutes or so. Um, if you think of something, feel free to enter that into the Q&A pod, and I will forward your questions along to our speakers. I'd like to thank, wait, let's look and see, there might be something. I'd like to thank our speakers for their presentations today, as well as all of you for your participation. And again, I will have the recording, both a direct link and a YouTube link to today's webinar uh, ready within the next couple of days, so likely by Monday. Uh, if I don't get to that tomorrow. So I'll send an email follow-up to everybody who has registered. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for hosting, Jennifer. You are very welcome. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. If there are no further questions. Just let me take a look one more time. Um, then we will go ahead and log off from the audio component, and I hope to see you at an upcoming webinar in the future. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Josh, and thanks, Cole. Yep, thank you. All right, bye-bye, everybody.